Welcome to everyone to a special Google Plus Hangout of the Online Bible Geek Listeners Community, recorded live to the Bible Geek Listeners YouTube channel. We are privileged to have with us today Dr. Elena Einhorn, well-known and respected Swedish physician, scientist, and filmmaker, whose wide-ranging expertise has resulted in many renowned projects, including television documentary productions of such award-winning historical dramas as Loving Greta Garbo, Nina's Journey, and pure historical programs such as Shadows of the Past. Questions raised in her thinking while working on the last name production, as recorded in her books, The Jesus Mystery, Astounding Clues to the True Identities of Jesus and Paul, 2007, and A Shift in Time, How Historical Documents Reveal the Surprising Truth About Jesus, 2015, resulted directly in these last two books of biblical scholarship. Our topic, then, for the greatest part of our hangout, should focus on Lena's time shift hypothesis, and its implications for the study of the historicity or non-historicity of Jesus of Nazareth. I'm your host and moderator, John Felix, co-producer of the Bible Geek Show podcast of Dr. Robert M. Price and head administrator of the Bible Geek Listeners Group on Facebook, among other things. On behalf of all Bible geeks and all interested students of biblical criticism throughout the world, greetings, Lena. Hi. <laughs> now, before we begin, briefly, I want to cover some guidelines for today's discussion. Am I still coming in clear? Yeah. All righty. If you have joined this Hangout as a participant, it is essential to have, as a minimum, an audio connection, though a webcam and mic would be ideal. If you intend not to ask or discuss something with the Hangout attendees, please leave the Hangout and listen to the live broadcast either on Google Plus or on YouTube. Hangouts have a maximum of 10 attendees at any one time. I will attempt to monitor the various places where text questions may be entered during the discussion, but to be honest, I am not that good at multitasking, though I'll try my best. My role then is to moderate the Hangout, field questions from non-participants, and keep the discussion moving along without monopolizing the microphone. I encourage everyone to speak up, though I ask that you give some form of identification at your personal discretion when you ask your question or engage in comments and discussions. As moderator, I reserve the right to eject anyone who does not follow basic rules of etiquette or who may pop in to disrupt this public meeting. And that's all I had to say on that. <laughs> so that's pretty um, straightforward. So Dr. Einhorn, welcome, as I said earlier. And uh, let me get rid of this real quick here. There we go. <laughs> I'm back. Everyone can still hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Um, to begin with, um, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, uh, recently I was rereading the Jesus Mystery and I only read part of it, but I was wondering, does your research that led into a shift in time book, did you feel that you had to revise any of your thesis from your previous book or was it an enhancement to your thesis or was it neutral? There was no kind of change at all in any of your thinking. Uh, I didn't feel like I had to revise, but what happened was that uh, uh, what the book that has the title The Jesus Mystery in English, it first came out in Sweden in 2006, uh, really started out, I started out exploring an entirely different hypothesis, and so this time shift uh, sort of grew as I was reading the book. I was almost halfway through writing it when I realized wow, uh, you know, I'm finding all this stuff in Josephus and, and it's not by chance that it's 20 years later, it's, it's a pattern. Um, so so the, the Jesus mystery really has two hypotheses presented out of which the time shift hypothesis is one. Uh, after I finished that book and after it came out, uh, it came out between 2006 and 2008 or 9 in different countries, I focused on the time shift hypothesis because it was so um, there was so much evidence that I could point to there. There was so much to explore, and I wanted to delve into that. Um, and and you know, in the years that have gone by, I've uh, written up. I started up by writing up uh, uh, like a scholarly paper on it. I couldn't get it published uh, in the Biblical journals. I finally uh, started, give, you know, being uh, invited to speak at the SPL Society of Biblical Literature uh, meetings. So I presented at like I think 
five different sessions or six um, at the at SPL, and the last one was in Chicago, 2012, and and I sort of came back to it, but finally I decided I want to get, I had so much more evidence had accumulated since I was uh, writing uh, The Jesus Mystery that I felt that I really wanted it published in some form. So that's why I wrote up A Shift in Time. So to, to, to make the answer short, I, uh, I've not revised anything, but there's a lot, of, lot more evidence that's accumulated. It's funny that you mentioned uh, the SPL conference in 2012 because I had emailed you earlier that I was at that conference, but we had just missed each other by a few minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and Dr. Price, because he knew that I knew who you were, he had mentioned that he had seen you and you had just yeah. left on your way to another meeting. So unfortunately, yeah, we could have met several years ago. <laughs> yes, that's yeah. great. <laughs> One of the reasons why I asked that question is um, since the basic thesis of a mis uh, the Jesus mystery is that uh, the person we know as Paul was in fact Jesus as well. If the time shift is correct, wouldn't that make more like um, Paul is Jesus in a sense that there is no historical Paul but rather only an historical person that you might call the Egyptian for instance and that he is the identity of both persons? Uh, I mean, the re one of the I mean, there are two reasons why I didn't uh, bring up the uh, Jesus Paul hypothesis in the in the second book, Shift in Time. First of all, because it obscures everything else, because it's so sensationalist, sensational. I wouldn't call it sensationalist, but it obscures everything else. And so I wanted to separate the two. That's one of the reasons. Uh, the other reason is that um, with that hypothesis. As I presented it in, in uh, the Jesus Mystery, there are arguments for and against. I wouldn't say, wow, you know, you can just look at this and you know it's true. It's, 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 I, that's, it's not that kind of hypothesis. There's one element in it which is very strong, and that is really Acts 2138, where, uh, where uh, Paul gets the question, so are you not then the Egyptian uh, who went out with uh, 4,000 Sicarians? 4,000 carry in the wilderness. That's the strong part of, of that hypothesis. The other stuff is for and against. I would say that the time shift hypothesis, which does not go against the Jesus and Paul hypothesis, but is not necessary for it, has much more evidence to it. And that's why I wanted to separate the two, and I wanted to focus on the time shift hypothesis. Um, those are the two reasons. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Okay, is that better? <laughs> Briefly, can you uh, summarize your shift in time hypothesis for those who might not be familiar with it? Yeah. You're getting a question there. I know, it's so far away. I have bad eyes. <laughs> could I turn on my microphone by myself? Was the question. Oh, okay. Yeah, I could turn you on, Martin. Just hold on a second. Yeah, I've got. Oops. There, he unmuted himself, and then I muted him back. <laughs> Sorry, Martin. Okay, go ahead and unmute yourself. No, you're not. Nothing. Hmm. Yeah, he still is showing his muted. Yeah, and I don't have a button to unmute him, so I think he's muting himself. Do you know how to turn that off, Martin? At the top center of the screen, you hover over there. There you yeah. go. No, no, there you're not. I'm on. Yeah. Yes. On. Okay. Uh, I myself am a mythicist. I consider myself as a mythicist, but uh, the argument seems seems very compelling. I think I think the argument is very unbiased. It's it's uh, it's well argument. I think as a mythicist, uh, there maybe was a, a, a mythical celestial figure, Jesus, and then the gospel writers were comparing him to uh, historical figures like the Egyptian and others like Theodos. Yeah, it's like demoting a, a, a celestial figure into a historical one by comparing historical sources. 
Okay. Yeah. That would okay. also be one of my questions too. Is that what criteria could you distinguish between uh, an actual historical usage by the gospel writers of the material from Josephus from a purely literary usage where they're just borrowing from the literature to create um, an historical uh, ver verisimilitude? I'll, I'll, I'll answer that and then I'll go back to your previous question which I never answered which is that I should present the time shift hypothesis briefly. I'll, I'll, I'll start the whole thing with the mythicist. We were, um, I was uh, having a um, on, on the Radar uh, website, there was a big discussion going on in the past week about my book, and um, Neil Godfrey and I discussed this aspect a lot about, you know, what would be literary constructs and what would be history. To my mind, uh, the New Testament is both. Uh, and I took up the, I brought up the very illuminating example of, of the fish, of the fishermen, the disciples that were fishermen, and they were, they were fishing for fish, and it says also that now, from now on, you will be fishing for men, the Gospels say. Now, there are obviously uh, Old Testament references to this, uh, Jeremiah, uh, Habakkuk, there are several references where it says, you know, and this is sort of eschatological thinking that that the the, the fish are men, uh, they are people, they are the, the, the Hebrew people, and, and there is, you know, there is calamities that are going to befall them, and then in the end they will be saved, and they will be restored, and etc., etc. So this is very clearly the, 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 example of, of fishing for men, which we have in the Gospels, is very clearly a, a literary, there's a literary context there. But there is also very um, concrete things that are being said, like the fish with a coin in its mouth. Now, what is the literary context with a fish with a coin in its mouth? My, I mean, my belief is, first of all, how I came into this was that I simply very clearly discovered parallels, purely historical parallels, uh, to the New Testament in Josephus. Um, and I, I, maybe I should um, take this from the beginning. So I was exploring this other hypothesis with Paul. I wasn't at all looking for a time shift. I wasn't even looking for Jesus in, in Josephus' books and for those who don't know, I mean, Josephus is our main source of uh, historical information on the Jewish realm in the first century. So he's the best, absolutely most important historical source to the New Testament, to the Gospels, and to, to the Acts of the Apostles that we have. This is the main source we compare the New Testament with when we look at history. Because it's written at the same time as the Gospels, and, it, and it's about the same, and there's so much material. But I was reading it, you know, for other reasons. And as I was reading Josephus, and I was reading the New Testament in parallel, you know, I came across really strange things. I, and I, I did what everybody does when you come across strange things that don't fit. You push it aside. Like, you know, there, everybody knows there are a few things in the Gospels that are chronologically very weird let's say, the birth of Jesus. Matthew puts it like before the death of Herod the Great, and he died 4 BC, uh, whereas Luke was at the time of the census, which is 10 years later than, than Herod the Great died. Everybody knows this. So, you know, so what do you do with this? Well, you say, who knows when he was born, or you find some kind of explanation, or you put it aside and you ignore it. There are other things like that. There are so obviously chronologically off. And one of them is in Acts chapter 5, uh, uh, yeah, where uh, the apostles are brought uh, to the Jewish council. This is obviously after the crucifixion of Jesus, and, and, and they're being interrogated. And at one point, Rabbi Gamliel gets up and he says, you know, be careful what you do with these men. For some time ago, Theodos, I don't, I don't, let's see if I have the exact, um, um, 
For some time ago, Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him, but he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and disappeared. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up at the time of the census and got people to follow him. He also perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. Now, there are two chronological aberrations in this little segment. First of all, Judas the Galilean came several decades before Theodos. He didn't come after Theodos. He was before Theodos. Um, Judas the Galilean was the one who started the, the, the rebellion under the census in 6 CE. Theodos was active uh, under procurator Fadus, uh, which was uh, 44 to 46 CE. So that's four years later. Do you still hear me? Because I lost pictures. You still hear me? Okay. But I think, I, I think we lost John, no? Yeah, I think we lost him. Yeah. Okay. John, are you back? Yes, I'm back. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I, where, where should I pick up from? Um, you were just discussing about Thutis, but don't worry. You don't have to bother recap all. Okay. So, so basically, <laughs> that's the first error, that Judas the Galilean came after Thutis. The second error is that the Thetis could not possibly have been killed before the interrogation at the Sanhedrin, at the Jewish Council, because he was killed between 44 and 46. So these are all known chronological aberrations. We put them aside because we say, oh, it's a mistake. It's a I kept seeing them. You know, the one after the other kept popping up that something was chronologically odd, one thing after another. And then I came to this guy, the Egyptian. And the Egyptian had so much in common with Jesus, but he was in the wrong time. He was in the 50s under procurator Felix. But there were so, so many similarities. Just like Jesus, he had come from the wilderness. Just like Jesus, he was preaching on the Mount of Olives. Just like Jesus, he said that the walls of Jerusalem would be torn down. Just like Jesus, he, was, he gathered disciples around him on the Mount of Olives. Just like Jesus, he was uh, perceived as a threat by the authorities. Just like Jesus, he seems to have been betrayed by someone and the authorities came after him. But I, I ignored it because the time was off. He was 20 years too late. And also because there was no crucifixion and there was a battle when he was defeated. There was a battle on the Mount of Olives. So I just ignored it. And, and in the meantime, all these other chronological things kept popping up when I was reading Josephus and the New Testament next to each other. Then one late one night I was looking at the Greek translation of John chapter 18 uh, next to the original. And in John, unlike in the Synoptic Gospels, it says that when Jesus is arrested on the Mount of Olives, he's met not only by the men sent out from the Jewish Council, but also by the band and the captain. But when you look at the original Greek, it doesn't say the band and the captain. It says Spera and Chiliarchos. And the Spera is a Roman cohort of between 600 and 1,000 men. And Chiliarchos means leader of 1,000. And you know, at that instant, it was, it was quite an awful experience, actually. I sort of, it sort of just <laughs> it's, the story sort of cracked open because that means there was, there must have been a battle for 1,000 men to confront him on the top of Mount Olives. And suddenly uh, it, it was just too similar to ignore. But in the meantime, I had had all these other chronological aberrations. And, and there was now, by now, a very clear pattern of a delay of about 20 years. I think a lot of people have recognized some of the... Um details that you point out, but nobody had related to Josephus. And I know that I had also seen some of these parallels, but like like a lot of people, I just ignored it because it didn't seem to apply or there didn't seem to be any kind of way to apply it to the gospel narratives. Um, a lot of people had theorized that there was some kind of rebel Jesus, but the gospels were disguising that fact 
but they had not stumbled upon the time shift hypothesis, which is probably one of the more intriguing things is that you, we uh, can now see through your, through your work that there is a possibility that all these events could actually be aligned with historical events as uh, depicted and recorded in Josephus. Um, the only trouble is that I have a big problem with Josephus, <laughs> and I'm, yeah. I'm very, I'm very um, I think it's very unfortunate that he's our main and sometimes only source for certain things of the first test, uh, first century in that area, because I think that there's a lot of bias in his writing. He has, uh, you know, a lot of self-serving information. But we'll get back into that in some other questions. I wanted to throw the forum open to other people. If anybody else had a, oh, Dr. Price has joined us. Yeah. Hello, Dr. Hi, Bob. Price. <laughs> Hi, how you doing? Hey, Bob. Hi. <laughs> Must be warm over there. Hey, Bob. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, just Bob, who all's here? I'm Wayne. Uh huh. Wayne, John. I'm Martin Gutt. Well. Yeah. Great to see everybody. It's like Hector's Hi. here. So, Lena, do you feel yeah. the Gospels accurately represent, or accurately tell us Jesus' own moral stances and message? If it accurately gives us Jesus' moral stance and message, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I do believe that once the Gospels were written, or maybe even more to the point, once they were edited and put together, this represented the, the faith uh, as they wanted it to be presented. Are you asking me if this represents the, the moral stance of the Egyptian himself? Yeah. In fact, yes, I do. I That's do backwards to me, but maybe you have to explain it to me. No, I, what I would say is, since I do believe uh, the Egyptian survived, I wouldn't even... I wouldn't even exclude the possibility that he participated in the in the writing down of the histories. Uh, I think that what happened before the Jewish War it was it was a horribly calamitous time, um, and I really think there is a not <laughs> BCE and CE, but there really, really is a B <laughs> before. Uh, the destruction of Jerusalem and after the Ju destruction of Jerusalem. And if the Egyptians survived, um, then I would say, yes, this probably does represent his moral stance. It may not have represented this, the moral stance of him or his movements in the 50s, but by the time it's written down, I do believe it does. <coughs> Why are you asking? It's an inqu interesting Why question. Why are you asking? Yeah, because it seems to me that the Gospels present basically an anti-zealot stance. That, I mean, they're, they're, they're basically saying that, you know, you don't want to follow the way of the zealots. Like the parable of, you know, Jesus Barabbas being set free is they're choosing the wrong alternative. They're choosing the wrong Jesus instead of the peaceful Jesus. They're choosing the warring Jesus instead, the wrong one. And the, the point of the Gospels is for them to choose the peaceful one. Okay, can I, can I, uh, you want me, can I answer it? Yeah. I, I, I would say that, and this is the point that I think I'm making, the New Testament as I see it, and particularly the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles, is not one book. It's at least two books. And one book is, is a religious, you know, anthology uh, full of uh, called literary aspects, theological aspects, um, belief systems, and then there's another level, and it's extremely present once you start looking for it, and that is a purely historical level. And in that purely historical level, there is so, mu so much zealotry, I mean, and especially in Luke and Acts. Um, every, if, you, if you think about it, every single major messianic leader of the first century is mentioned in Acts. Yeah. You have you have Judas the Galilean, you have Theodos, uh, you have uh, the Egyptian, and you have Manaen, which is the, yeah. the Greek name for Menahem. You have all of them there. And not only that, in the situations which 
are described as peaceful, such as when Jesus tells uh, Peter to put away the sword, he has just before them, according to Luke, what is it, chapter 22, yeah. that he's, he's told everybody to get swords. And the, yeah. ones, who, the, the ones who has yeah. no sword should go and get a sword, yeah. should buy a sword. Yeah. Yeah. There are double entendres all the time. It's a, and yeah. I don't think that the reason that it's all there in, in, the, in, the, in the Gospels and in Acts is not because... Jesus has different opinions about this, but it's because just like Josephus, they want to um, save their history, yeah, and they want it. They want to be true to themselves. Now, I'll, pass and they don't want, huh? I'll pass a question on to somebody else in a minute here, but I do want to follow up on this. So, yeah. like Mark thirteen has a warning against there'll be many false Christs and stuff coming up. I mean, how is well, has God, it, has how it, 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 I, I, there's a warning in, in, in Mark 13 in the little apocalypse. There's a warning about you know there being many false Christs and stuff. So how is the many false false messiahs? Uh -huh, okay, okay. So, so how is how is um, the real Jesus being set aside, being being differentiated from them? I mean, what is it? What is different in the view you have of the, the, the Egyptian as a messiah from all the other false Christs that the Gospels are warning against? Well, I mean, you know, this is written afterwards. This is written after the fact. This is, this is, this is a book that is talking about one of the Messiah leaders. You know, it's we don't know to what extent he was in reality different from the other ones. For sure, he's different at the time when this is written. I really do believe that the peaceful aspects of of the religion that are presented in the Gospels and in Acts are true. I really believe that it became a religion that was advocating, to a large extent at least, was advocating peaceful means. But at the time when, when the Egyptian was active and when Theodos was active and when Judas the Galilean was active and when Menachem was active, this was not a peaceful time and the zealots were not peaceful. I do also, believe... Don't go, Robert. Also, it, it's long occurred to me that that after the fact prediction so called in mark is assuming that there are christians who or at least people that would be taking the little apocalypse seriously who are identifying or confusing jesus with Judas and the others yeah. uh, you you don't tell people to do what they're already not doing and uh, it, it seems to me there was, it, it implies, it presupposes that there must have been readers who were thinking either, gee, these guys must be the return of Jesus, or at least these guys must be the Messiah. And, uh, and the uh, attempt is to uh, dissociate Jesus from them, which I, I think is just what Lena is saying is happening with this retrojection uh, into the like 40 years in the past. Uh, and, and in a sense, this is a, an extremely ingenious improvement on on uh, Brandon's hypothesis that you do have to look below the surface, though not very deeply, to find the signs of the original revolutionary character uh, of the uh, of the Jesus movement, whatever the heck it was. And so there are loose ends that are are still evident, uh, but uh, all the pacifistic, even pro-Roman stuff that Eisenman talks about is a result of this apologetic whitewashing tendency, and that's just what Lena's saying has happened, if I've got to write uh, by uh, th pushing these things back into a non-violent time. Uh, Burton Mack says that also, though he doesn't see the role of Thutis and Menachem and the others. Uh, but he says it's pretty clear that the, the uh, triumphal entry, the cleansing of the temple, really reflect events around uh, 70 that have been pushed back and I think what Lena is doing is is like finishing up that picture in an unexpected way yeah yeah I think a lot of the connections Lena finds are, are legitimate I do think the gospel authors intend the connections that she's saying 
I'm convinced of that. I, not all of them, but most of them. But I don't think her explanation is correct, but I do think the evidence she finds is accurately there. Which what, is what's, what, 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 what explanation is not correct? Well, I don't think there's a time shift. I think the gospel authors are just doing a pastiche of, of different items and just taking, you know, comparing Jesus to these other revolutionaries and taking, you know, things from B.C. and A.D. and combining them. I mean, I think probably that the Judas that betrayed Jesus actually represents Jesus the Galilean, you know, the, exactly. starting, of, the starting of this movement. But basically, Jesus is there, is, is, is standing allegorically for Jerusalem, and he's basically saying, you know, it's the Jews' own fault that they lost the city. Uh, can I answer that? I mean, when I when I start when I first started seeing the pattern, almost all of it was pertaining to the 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 time after uh, the death of Agrippa the first, when the when the revolutionary movement came back. Um, it was all you know around the time of Theodos <clears throat> and the Egyptian. As I got deeper into it, I started realizing that. All of the parallels that I found pertain to revolutionary activity, but they weren't all in the 40s and 50s. I think you're right that Judas Iscariot may well be Judas the Galilean because Iscariot and Sicarius is, are two words that are very similar. Uh, and, and, and as a matter of fact, the only parallel which is very clearly the accurate time and the accurate action that you find before the death of Agrippa the first is the census under Quirinius, which is very obviously the you know it, it's described in the same terms. What is not there at all in Josephus when you compare it with the gospel tales, when you see the parallels between the gospels and Acts and Josephus, you I have not found a single parallel between 6 CE and 44 CE. That is the time when Jesus is supposed to be active and. And why not? Because they were completely quiet at that time, the Lestai, the, the robbers. This was not a period of revolutionary activity. Yeah. And it's not that I haven't been looking, it's that the only parallel that really seems uh, in the Gospels, if you take away Acts for, for the time being, the only parallel that seems to be portrayed the same way in, in, uh, in the Gospels and in Josephus, not only by name, because you find a lot of names that you find in both sources, but they don't do the same things. But the, the one person that, the, or the same event that seems to be portrayed both at the right time and the, and the correct action is the census on the Quirinius. After that, it all, as far as I can see, as far as I've found, pertains to activities that are later, at a different time. But that later is not only 40s and 50s. Some of it, and more and more, as I read more and more of Josephus, I find uh, references to the Jewish war. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah, I am. Now, Did anyone else have anything? I, I, I just want to add one thing also to, to, the, to the thing Wayne said about, uh, you know, pastiche, etc. Uh, it's interesting, you know, uh, um, I've, you know, I've been dealing with this now for about well, 10 years or so, and I've been presenting at a, at a number of, uh, of conferences, at SBL conferences, etc. And the interesting thing is that when I have presented to more traditional scholars that believe that Jesus existed, but maybe was not prominent in his own time, etc., when they are in the room, uh, you know, I, I I see them. They're on. You know, they 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 follow my thinking. They're there. They they will even say, "Wow, you know, this this really has to be talked about." Or they can even say more than that. But once they leave the room, you know, it's it's like it never happened. And I never got the paper accepted for publication. I, I, it, it hasn't been. Now, when it comes to mythicists. Mythicists don't believe, or I mean, there are various kinds of mythicists, but at least most mythicists say that Jesus mostly was a, a literary character, a theological, literary theological construct, whatever you want to. There are many different, or 
in any in any event, the mythicists are willing to talk to me and and discuss it, which is really interesting. But I find that um, mythicists stick to their guns, perhaps even more than uh, than traditional scholars do in this. In that they 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 I, you, please contradict me if I'm wrong, but that one really wants to see Jesus as not a prominent living actual political historical figure. You may prove me wrong. I think a lot of mythicists that are most prominent, most vocal, and that might you might hear from are probably the most convinced of their own positions, perhaps. But you know, for instance, this particular group, like you say, we're more open-minded, so we're willing to. Um, Consider these ideas at least, you know, maybe not accept them or maybe accept part way or something. Like that. But you know, yeah. we're not so dogmatic. I don't think, at least the Bible. I, I, I do want to add though that I that I definitely see the the New Testament full of literary um, references and references to the Old Testament. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, uh, what you say about the people at the SBL uh, nodding in agreement uh, while the door is still closed, but when they go back out into the academic world, uh, you know, Lena, who's that? Never heard of her. And the, and the cock crows. Uh, it, it's like they're, they're like uh, Nicodemus in the Gospel of John, right? They're afraid of excommunication if they admit that they uh, uh, believe what you're saying, and uh, they don't want to be branded a nut. And, uh, you know, feeling, I, I mean, uh, being branded a nut is, is something I know very well. Uh, I just don't happen to care, and obviously you don't either, but some people do, and uh, they're not going to, you know, champion or even be seen seriously discussing ideas that would, like to use the cliche, be a game changer, that would really change the rules. And so uh, that's why these paradigm shifts take so long. Too many people have uh, a lot invested in the traditional way of looking at things. And that doesn't make them villains, but it's, it sure explains how there's more than sheer intellectual curiosity at stake. Uh, there's tenure and uh, being uh, not shut out of the discussion and so on, and they just can't face that. These are also, I, I have to, these are also very emotional issues one has to remember this is not this you know it's even if one wants to hold faith completely separate from history it's it, it's not always possible and I also want to add uh, and this is important I don't think I've proven anything I'm I'm putting out evidence and it's for each and every person to evaluate that evidence and I constantly get from other people get new ideas and new perspectives on this so I don't claim to sit with the final answer. I just think it's interesting in the discussion uh, how how people do relate to these issues. I have to say, Lena, even if I don't follow you entirely to your thesis, you you forever changed how I'm going to look at the Gospels. I mean, I I I believe you that these connections are there. I don't read them the same way you do, but I believe they're there, and that that entirely changes my picture of how I read it from now on. Okay. So I think that's a success on your part. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I mean, you know, it's. I just, I just, to me, I, uh, I love history, and to me, this is really, it's one of the most exciting and and, um, you know, it, it's so. I think the New Testament is such a brilliant book. It's so fantastically woven together with all these layers, uh, and there were precedents for it. I mean, you know, you have the the, the Pasher technique of the of the of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Midrash and all this. I mean, this is it's, it wasn't uncommon, but it's so brilliantly put together with with all these different layers of of theology and history woven in together. I think it's marvelous. Yeah, I perfectly agree with you because yeah, there is a lot of interesting uh, parallels and uh, accounts like that. I've got a problem with certain mythicist arguments that are so um, uh, exaggerated. Like, uh, there are uh, parallels between pagan gods that are, are not sourced and that are so extreme, they are so un unconvincing. I do, I do think that there are certain parallels. Like, 
uh, for instance, the, the resurrection uh, appearance where Jesus is walking on water and uh, 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 they catch up some fish and uh, I don't know how, how is that exactly occur, the story, I forgot now. Well, uh, the um, as Bultmann pointed out, like on the one hand, he was more uh, enthusiastic about all these parallels than anybody else and just dumps truckloads of them uh, on his reader. But then he says no sane person would deny that there was a historical Jesus. Well, I think that's a little bit of uh, defensiveness because some thought he was virtually doing that. But he's right. Uh, he, there could have been a Jesus uh, who got mythologized. So these mythic parallels don't uh, prove or even argue that there was no historical Jesus. In my mind, it's it's other factors, like you just don't really have anything left over uh, once you bracket all of that stuff. Uh, everything seems to be, I mean, forget about the dying and rising gods and Pythagoras or the Buddha walking on water. Um, what, what do you have in terms of any kind of... Um, historical biographical information if everything else seems to match Old Testament stories to such a striking uh, degree and what have you got left and and that's why I always say it seems to me that the burden of proof is on the one that would say there was a historical Jesus somewhere in the bottom of the barrel but uh, and thus it seems more probable to me there was no historical Jesus but as Lena said like you don't want to be a fanatical crank you know I've discovered the truth I'm the only one that's uh, ever known it since the Apostle Paul that's like the Jehovah's Witnesses and stuff uh, historians don't take that approach and uh, so <laughs> so uh, yeah some of that stuff really d are not uh, clinching arguments for mythicism but Bob uh, uh, let me ask you I mean um, I would go along with you uh, when one looks at what's there in in the 30s, uh, in the historical sources, not not only Josephus, but, I mean, there's nothing. If you take away the testimonium Flavianum, there's nothing that supports an existence of Jesus. But when you start looking at the time shift, I think, you know, you at least have to see the pattern is, it's, it's not a haphazard pattern, it's really a pattern that seems to point constantly to the same time period, um, wouldn't you say that at, at least would mean that the myth mythicists should probably start rethinking a little bit if, 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 if Jesus existed as a, as, a, as a historical person or not? I mean, I, the, the, what I'm saying is I'm with you in the 30s. There is nothing there. But I, I believe there is something there in the, in the late 40s and 50s. Well, actually, the parallels, which are so pronounced with uh, all these guys, uh, uh, Simon Bargioras and Menachem and all that, are one of the things that really helped turn me toward mythicism. I, because I feel like if there was a historical Jesus, then the Brandon hypothesis that he was a revolutionist, uh, a zealot and all that, it, that would have to be the historical Jesus. But then I wonder, well, wait a minute. Suppose that uh, the gospel writers have simply borrowed this stuff from Josephus, as Luke certainly did, and uh, they're, they're giving Jesus some color uh, and uh, and and doing what they did with the uh, with the Old Testament and just kind of putting meat on the bare bones of what was originally a myth of a celestial deity uh, killed by the prince and pal principalities and powers, but I, I still think that the most plausible one of the historical Jesus theories is Jesus the revolutionist. Uh, and but but, but if, if, if they just wanted to put color, then they, you would have expected them to put him in the, in the right era, right? This uh, is, not necessarily, uh, especially if, uh, I mean, they, I don't know that the, um, the uh, specific date would have mattered to these guys, especially since they couldn't even agree on how old Jesus was when he died. Uh, and these other problems with the census of Quir Quirinius being linked with the, uh, the, uh, the birth of Jesus and, and all of that stuff, uh, that, uh, it, it, it's, well, it also becomes a problem to me that 
it's a very, very thin line between saying the real Jesus was uh, 40 years later and saying that uh, Jesus is a fictional distillation of all these guys pushed back uh, and that early Christians, quote-unquote, messianists, could have been uh, first members of these various failed revolutionary groups, whitewashing it with, uh, since some of them were repeating Joshua's feats or claimed to, that Jesus may simply be a reference to that, and they had it in common. No way to know, but... Uh, but, I um, mean, it's not, it's not, I mean, I would be with you if, if, if these parallels were spread out all over the place, but, but they're not. I mean, I have a, I have a table where I, mm -hmm. where I look at different aspects uh, of the New Testament, of the Gospels, uh, which, where, where it's obviously anachronistic or it's, it's in the wrong time. For instance, mm -hmm. Jesus is being, buried, uh, is being uh, crucified with robbers. Now, there were no robbers under Pilate. At least Josephus is exceptionally completely quiet about robbers during robbers are rebels now according to mm -hmm. Josephus but they were there and then there you know there are a number of, of, of procurators they were there under one of them being Felix crucifixions outside of the testimony of Flavianum Josephus mentions no crucifixions under Pilate two named co-reigning high priests there were no two co-reigning high priests under Pilate. I mean, yes, it was Annas and Caiaphas, but there, there were three, uh, three. Uh, oh, there's, the, the, there's, there were three uh, uh, high priests between them. But under Felix and uh, and just before him, there were two co-reigning high priests. Uh, it says that uh, Pilate was uh, slaughtering Galileans. Uh, the, the killing the Galileans, Pilate was not at all the procurator or the prefect over Galilee. He was over Judea. Felix was the procurator over both parts of Galilee and, and Judea. Uh, the Gospels describe a conflict between the procurator and the Jewish king, Pilate, between Pilate and the Jewish king. Uh, there is no visible such conflict between Pilate and Herod Antipas, but there is one between Felix and Agrippa II, because uh, Felix married uh, the sister of Agrippa II, which, which was against the laws of, of the nation. Uh, the, it goes on and on, a uh, conflict between Galileans and Samaritans. The, the, there was no mention of a conflict between Galileans and Samaritans uh, during Pilate's time. Of course, there may have been under the surface in Josephus, but there was a war between them that ended when Felix came to power. I mean, it's like it keeps on one thing mm. after the other that just keeps fitting a different era. And it's not any different era. It's always the same different era, which is about 20 years later. Doesn't your argument depend on actually identifying these various figures with Jesus and, and then saying this Jesus has been pushed back 40 years, or is 20 it... Years. Uh, 20 years. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, whereas uh, it would be hard to prove that that's what happened rather than that people took the events and personae of that period and, and pushed them back and gave and it the name of Jesus to the com combined figure. I mean, the only justification I can find for actually moving events from uh, the 20s to, uh, for, uh, sorry, from the 50s to the 30s, to move them 20 years back is to want to hide something, not to want to use elements, but rather to want to hide something. Can I interject Why? here? Yeah. I had, I had an idea just come to me here. One of the things that struck me reading your book was yeah. the connection between Jesus' disciples and the various revolutionary figures throughout history. Not all from the same decade either, but you know what? Right. I'm wondering if maybe the point of the Gospels is that the revolutionaries didn't listen to Jesus. So maybe maybe the Gospel writers is putting him back before the beginning of their time, telling them what they should do. They don't listen. They go on these revolutions, and then that's why everything failed later. Uh, 
you're saying that they didn't listen and, and they were basically then at the same time or after you, which is what you're saying. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? I got an echo now, so I can't hear you. No, I was really struck by the connection between the different revolutionaries and Jesus' disciples. Did somebody yeah. mute with their microphone? Yeah, it some, sounds like somebody... Yeah, I think yeah, Kevin that just thing. joined us was uh, echoing, so I muted him temporarily. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'm just so, wondering if this is like no, a fictional portrayal of what would be the case, you know, had somebody warned them before what would happen, but they didn't listen to his warning. Well, uh, I would, I would put it like this. Uh, I have a whole chapter about Peter, and I think that there is at least a valid argument that should be looked at if he was uh, identical to Menahem, uh, who was uh, active at the beginning of the Jewish war. Um, I actually put, quote, I put all of Acts 5, I guess it is, next to segments from war and antiquities, you know, without interruption, and it's like the same story uh, with small changes. It's, it's in my book. Um, if so, then Menahem obviously came uh, after the Egyptian. And if the Egyptian failed in his mission, which he must have done, he, he, he was not heard from again, uh, uh, Josephus says, then one can at least speculate that the, the zealot leaders that came after the Egyptian were not embracing him, let's put it that way. I don't want to so take too much had, time with Huh? I don't want to take too much time away from you, but I wanted to ask Bob if he understood my question and what he thought. So it's, uh, I, see, I, I don't know, it, it seems speculative, but everything does. Um, the, you understand what is, I was trying to say. I didn't really word it as well as I could have, but. Yeah, hmm. I got to think about that a, a bit more. Um, so it's like, like uh, th this is uh, what's this like an name? alternate history. Somebody's writing, you know, this is not what really happened. But what would happen if somebody went back and warned them all these all these revolutionaries and stuff, and gave them a more peaceful message at the beginning? So they're written in as kind of being Jesus' disciples in a way. Oh no! Aha! Uh -huh. Now I see what you mean. I mean, if 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 I if I am if I'm to guess, my guess is that that. At the time that the New Testament is, is put together, at the time that the Gospels and are written, then the, the religion has changed, and it is a more peaceful religion. That is my guess. But what is provided is not only the new peaceful religion, but the old history of what brought it about, and that was not a peaceful situation, because yeah. it was the time when Rome was occupying Judah and Galilee, and it was a time of catastrophe. The previous, um, well, the, the, in the in the Gospel of Luke, he you mentioned in an earlier interview that I watched that the birth of Jesus being placed at the same time as the rise of the rebellion in Josephus, in about six C.E. with Judas the Galilean, was a symbolic um, identification of the peaceful Jesus being born at the same time as this period of re rebellion. In the sub by Luke being um, the uh, gospel author that brings up the subtext where it's a little bit more recognizable. Isn't that very dangerous? Doesn't that kind of almost make it where he wants people to see a revolutionary subtext? And what would be the purpose possibly of doing something But did like you that? see it? Did you see it? I mean, I don't think people have seen it. I don't think, because he doesn't mention the, 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 the rebellion there. He does mention it actually later in, in Acts. He mentions the, the census and the rebellion and the Judas Galilean, but he doesn't mention it in Luke, where where uh, where it just says that uh, Jesus was born. It's the birth of Jesus instead of the birth of the rebellion. It is the birth, according to Josephus, that tax the te tax census under Quirinius was the birth of the organized rebellion. Uh, you can argue if Josephus is right, but that's how Josephus <laughs> presents it. It was the birth of the organized rebel movement. Now, in, in, in Luke, it's the birth of Jesus, and he doesn't mention the birth of the rebel movement. He just mentions the tax. 
but if people were aware that of of Josephus's uh, assignment of the of organized revolt against Rome being in that same period that he mentions as Jesus's birth, isn't he kind of like begging you to draw a parallel there? That okay. But, but have people done that? People haven't drawn the parallel. I think that that's the point. It's so full of subtext that people don't draw the parallel. They look at this and they say, why is he mentioning Judas? I don't have a clue. Let's check it out. Why is he mentioning Judas the Galilean? I don't know. And he's putting him in the wrong order. He's putting him after Theodos, so he's making some kind of weird mistake. Let's check that one out, too. And, and there's so much that's being chucked out. And why is he presented as being born before uh, 4 BCE in, in Matthew and, and in 6 CE, 10 years later in Luke? I don't know. Let's check it out. So there's all this information that's just thrown in there, you know. And why is Paul asked about whether he, so then you are not the Egyptian? Or why is he asked that question? I don't know. Let's check it out. And so people, ha it's, it's full of those, you know, names or whatever dropped into the narrative. And they don't make any sense. So people chuck them out. They don't, they, they look upon it as, Somebody made a mistake. Somebody wrote something strange, something erroneous. Let's not regard it as anything. To people outside, that may, would be, like you say, like seemingly random things that are dropped in. But people in the know might be looking for those kind of things. So if you specifically bring up all these details about known revolutionaries and scatter yeah. it throughout your work, that's almost a subtext that you want people to discover, that you're putting it there specifically like in um, the prologue for Luke's Gospel, he mentions the truth that he wants Theophilus to know. Or maybe perhaps the truth is the revolutionary aspect that he wants those in the know to be able to spot by putting those details in. So they're not random only for outsiders or people that don't have the uh, copy of Josephus perhaps <laughs> to read alongside of it. Right. But if he, had, if he had put the whole story in the 40s and the 50s, everybody would have seen it. But he... They don't. They put it in the 30s. And in the 30s, there are no known parallels to this, so it all just becomes weird. And, and that, is, that is the, you know, and, and if, I, if, if I am to guess why they, if it really happened in the 40s and the 50s, and if they really moved it from, from then to 20 years earlier, why would they do a thing like that? And the only reason I can come up with is they did not want to have alternate histories. And they preferred, uh, ah, what is the question? Was Luke pretending to write to the mid-first century high priest Theophilus? Um, you know what? As far as I'm concerned, Theophilus could be the Egyptian. Yeah, who the uh, identity of Theophilus is. This is a much yeah. debated question. It could be somebody as late as the second century, I believe. Uh, there are some mentions of various people. Or it could be a purely a uh, symbolic name. You know, yeah, it's, it's, sure. it's almost impossible to tell. Sure. And the Gospels, I see a lot of interpretation, interpreting the Old Testament story, such as uh, Moses being persecuted by the Pharaoh, and then Jesus in Matthew uh, is being persecuted by Herod the Great. I think that's a, that's a, a clear uh, evidence that, that there is a lot of interpretation, rewriting Old Testament stories. Mm. Mm. Can I answer that? Because that's a very interesting yeah. thing. Uh, yeah. As I said before, I believe there is a lot of literary references to the Old Testament. And the thing with Jesus in Egypt is, a, is an obvious one coming out of Egypt, just like Moses did. And then at the same time, when you look at the historical and religious texts that, that we, after, after all, we have, you see this mention again and again that the, G that the Jews said about Jesus that he came out of Egypt and he brought magic out of Egypt. It's said again and again. The first person who said it was Celsus in 175 uh, CE. And, 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 uh, and then Origen, who, 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 who takes uh, uh, Celsus' words down, he argues against it, but he doesn't argue against Jesus coming from Egypt. And then you have a story from the third century, uh, Arnobius, yes, who says, oh, my, the enemies of Christianity will claim that Jesus came from Egypt and brought magic with him. 
And then you have uh, uh, Amulo, who is a bishop of Lyon in the 9th century, saying that in their own language, the Jews call Jesus uh, Dissipator Egyptius, which means the Egyptian disperser or the Egyptian destroyer. And then you have the, the Sefer Toldot Yeshu, which was like a parodical, satirical gospel, that says that Jesus' father was called the Egyptian because he did the work of the Egyptians. So the whole thing with Jesus having come out of Egypt as an adult, not as a child, is not limited to, to, to the New Testament and to, and to Matthew. So you can see both. You can see, okay, he came like Moses out of Egypt. That's sort of a literary illusion. And then you see these references all over the place. It, the Talmud says that Jesus, or they call him Ben Pantera, or Ben Stada, came out of Egypt. It's full of these uh, allusions to Jesus really having come as an adult out of Egypt. So that's why I'm saying I think that, that the New Testament accomplishes both. It's both history and mythology, uh, mythology and literary allusions and theology, but it's also history. It's clear. It's clear that uh, jo oh, uh, uh, Matthew is drawing from from the Josephus account of Moses. There is another. There is another different account of Moses being persecuted. It's in Josephus. I think Doctor Price mentioned it in the in the Incredible Shrinking Son of Man. I saw that in, in in that part of the book. It's clear. It's clear that may, maybe he's he's combining mythological, allegorical, and historical stuff. It, it's a mixture of both. I think that's what I see. Yeah, I think that I think that's true. That's what I believe. It's reasonable. It's not. It's mm. not. A, it's it's plausible. Mm. Yeah, this whole thing is is fascinating, and uh, the uh, incredible amount of evidence and parallels you've come up with it it really demands a lot of study and and uh, being taken seriously, or or um, anybody that that uh, brushes it off, I think is just too lazy to uh, to to take a look at it as you have. It really is extremely fascinating, uh, very compelling. Thank you. I'm impressed that you had, stuff. I'm impressed that you had the courage to write about this because writing about a lot of this controversial stuff can get you marginalized in scholarship. So. Well, I'm not a scholar. I'm not. I'm. Uh, I mean, I was. <laughs> I was a medical scholar, but I'm not a. a I'm not a theologian. I'm not a biblical scholar. Uh, to me, this is. I mean, I love history. To me, this was a historical riddle. But I came, I really came to it from, I mean, it is my, in a sense, my return to, to research. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a historical journey for me. Uh, it's, it's a pity that it's a controversial one. Uh, I wish it hadn't been. I wish it, we could have regarded it as sort of a historical riddle to solve, but you know, it is the it is in the arena of, of faith, which makes it so much more complicated. Unfortunately, it makes it so much more complicated, uh, and and I don't think it should impinge on that. I mean, I really think that the the area of historical Jesus research has you know it's been existing for well over two hundred years. Um, it, it is. It always touches on faith. That is the problem. It, it always touches on faith, and so it becomes enmeshed with those issues. Um, and it's it is very hard to hold them separate. But I I I, I must say I I wish that it would have been a pure historical riddle. From my point of view, I wish it had been. Well, when you when you uh, approach these subjects from outside the New Testament guild. You have a tendency to uh, be attacked and ridiculed, so you end up having a lot of vitriol thrown your way, which uh, rather than dealing with the issues that you raise, they en it ends up being um, a kind of a personality kind of thing, an ad hominem attack, which is unfortunate. I, I, I don't, I, I, I must say, I haven't uh, felt attacked in that sense, but uh, so, so that's not been an issue, but it's been hard to get it published, and uh, and you know, I just want it. I just want to have it in the discourse 
if you want to put it that way. It can be it, it can be buried, but I just want it to be in there somewhere. I don't want to I don't want to you know create a revolution. That's not my 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 desire. I just want it to be you know it it has been a fascinating historical journey, and I just want it to be documented. That's it. Did anyone else have want to comment on that? Because uh, I wanted to bring up cover a little bit more ground. It's another point. I see a problem when people take such things like this, like issues like this, take them as dogmas, personal dogmas. I think it's best that you stay open-minded because you might never know what new things might turn up and you can change your mind. Yeah, yeah. I, I always feel that uh, if somebody were, to, I've said this ad nauseum, but if uh, somebody were to discover uh, a genuine ancient papyrus that uh, where somebody is just writing a, a letter home to his wife uh, from uh, Palestine and said, I, I happened to hear uh, the renowned Nazarene Jesus uh, speak today, and, and, uh, and it was a good experience. That's all it would take for me to say, okay, to heck with the Christ myth theory. Uh, I guess he <laughs> did exist, and it might happen. Who knows? You, you can't yeah. rule it out. Uh, the the terror of of uh, the apologist who has to worry constantly is somebody going to discover you know Jesus lies buried here or something like that no 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 we can't have that and so whatever does come up has to be explained away and like a political spin doctor uh, it's just disgusting. Hmm. Well, it's you know it's interesting that you brought up uh, the uh, tune and all that stuff. It, I mean, the, 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 the research is not a. It, it doesn't matter if it's theology or if it's uh, mathematics or if it's uh, biology. It's not. It's we we make our decisions with our with our hearts, not with our heads. You know, even even uh, scientists do that. We 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 think. You know, I. I, I saw this. I took it down. It was a quote I saw uh, in a in a. It was a, a, an illusionist. Uh, it was an illusionist who said in a television program, and I wrote it down. He said, "People think they believe what they choose to believe. We don't. We mostly believe what we need to believe." And that goes for all of science. You know, I mean, it's uh, it doesn't matter how brilliant we are. We we. You know, it's that's that's not the side of our brain that we tend to to make decisions with. But it's it that is very fascinating and um, it's interesting and it teaches you something to see how how people deal with new ideas in any field. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Plus the magician thing. I, I just find this ironic that if some of these apologists had been around to see the sleight of hand tricks that magicians were doing in the first century, uh, fake miracles, uh, then, uh, well, like the, the ventriloquist stunt in the book of Revelation that the false prophet makes the image of the beast speak, that was a common uh, party trick uh, back then. And uh, who knows what else they were doing. You'd have a religion founded on one of those guys. And uh, mm -hmm. when you look at a magician today, a, a confessed illusionist, who, who says, now you know I'm not doing any miracle, nobody but he's convinced of that because he says it right off the bat. But uh, the 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 thing that wows the audience is how the heck did he do that? Uh, and that's all the stage magician is asking for. But you could very easily say, "I am, ladies and gentlemen, performing a miracle, and I want to uh, let you know that uh, that proves I'm the son of God." Uh, it wouldn't be very uh, hard to, to start a new cult that way, and. So it's like the historical problem for the believer is, well, I believe Jesus did those miracles, but gee, what if somebody figured out how he did it? Uh-oh. Let's hope nobody does. <laughs> but Bob, there's an, I think there's another aspect to this, because this, it was an exceptionally timely religion. I mean, the Greeks and the Romans were crying out for a new religion. They were tired of their old deities. And... And 
it was also, you also had someone like Paul, who was, I don't think there's anybody in history, he didn't have an army, he didn't have television, he didn't have anything, he didn't, certainly didn't have the internet, single-handedly spread this religion around the Mediterranean. It's an unbelievable feat. And on top of that, it happened, it, it, the, the, the up, whatever, the, the up, it came from, from a religion that was started in a nation that was utterly destroyed. It grew out of the ashes of something that didn't, that no longer existed. And this is true of Judaism too. I think that, that and these are the final words in, in my book, I mean it's really both Christianity and Judaism grew out of the ashes of a non-existing nation, basically. Uh, and they both grew, they both had to, re I mean Judaism renewed itself as much as, as Christianity did in, in this, it became a an, an entirely different religion to, to, mm. to a large extent. So I think that the timeliness of, of Christianity and the incredible skill of, 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 the, of Paul when he's spreading it around combined with the, 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 the desire of the Greeks and the Romans for, for new deities to, to, really, to really make this a religion that caught on. Yeah, everything was expecting MSA, I think. At the time it was full of trouble and it's yeah. reasonable. Yeah. Hey, Lena, have you had time to look for these kind of connections in extra canonical gospels also? Uh, a little bit. You know, my, you know, to be honest, my, my way of looking doing this has not been to like go through Josephus from the first to the last line or, or even the, the New Testament from the first to the last line. I sort of catch stuff as I read about it or I make connections, I see connections other people have made, I look into. So I've, I've looked at some extra canonical stuff when it's come up, but not in any systematic fashion. So I'm sure there's more interesting stuff there. Mm. And you know, by the way, I think I have found 1% of what there is in this parallels between Josephus and the New Testament. I think there's so much more there that I haven't found. Because every time I go back to the material, I find something new. And there's so much stuff there. It's, that's why I'm saying the New Testament is brilliantly written. I don't think a single word is there by chance. Have you read Joseph Atwill's Caesar's Messiah? No, but I had a, a, a prolonged discussion with him. Uh, on the reader uh, page uh, after uh, uh, you know Neil had published some reviews of my stuff, so I'm sort of a little bit familiar with it. Um, I think he has some interesting points. I he he's the typical kind of example where I can see someone put out something and I haven't thought about it and I thought mm, that's interesting, but I don't agree with his conclusion. If you follow me, mm -hmm. like for instance. Uh, Joseph uh, from Arimathea, I mean, he suggests it's, uh, it's Josephus. I think that's a valid suggestion. I think that may well be the case. Uh, I have to think about it. I wouldn't draw his conclusions, but he's entitled to his conclusions. Uh, from what I understand, he's basically saying it's a, it's a Roman construct. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think so. Yeah, me neither. But you're you're exactly right. Uh, if there there's some connections he makes that seem to me just comically far fetched. But then he'll say something like that, the Joseph of Arimathea, and, and that is an older theory before him. Yeah. Uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, and yeah. for the thing he says about uh, they will see the sign of the Son of Man uh, in in the sky and so on. Well, could that be a reference to what Josephus says about how during the Roman siege people were seeing uh, human figures and chariots and so on in the sky? Yeah. Uh, I never thought of that. Uh, yeah. Fascinating. But you know, this is always, and this is actually what Neil said to me, and, and no, he didn't say it, he said it to someone else, but I picked up on it in the discussion. We Once we have a hypothesis, we always have to be careful or we always run the risk of looking at things with tinted uh, glasses, looking for, for to prove our, our hypothesis. Confirmation bias. Huh? Yeah, Confirmation exactly. bias. Confirmation bias, exactly. 
Uh, Though on the other hand, you it's entirely legitimate to say uh, how much sense would this paradigm make of the evidence, and and it's a, you test it out to see, like Dennis McDonald's book on uh, Mark's Gospel and the Homeric Epics. Some of the parallels he finds with the Iliad and the Odyssey seem to me kind of insignificant, but I understand his point is, let's see how far we can push this at the point it becomes implausible. Okay, we found the limitations of it. So I don't really think that's axe grinding. You're just seeing, you know, how far might this work? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I and I will say uh, in my only uh, sort of, uh, I would say I'm not suffering any any less from confirmation bias than anybody else. I will say this though, that I wasn't looking for what I found. I was looking for something else, uh, and it and it's and I'm amazed at myself for how long I pushed it aside, how, <laughs> for how long I ignored what I saw, because when it finally sort of hit me, it hit me really hard. And it was when when I uh, when I uh, read the, the the Greek original of and saw that there were a thousand men coming to arrest uh, the Egyptian uh, Jesus on the Mount of Olives, and then it was just too close. But once it sort of like hits me like that, then suddenly there was there were forty other parallels that suddenly fell into place that I had completely ignored up until then. And it, so it's really interesting how our brains work, you know. I could see my own brain at work <laughs> and see for how, for how long because it didn't fit my what I was looking for or my preconceived notions. I just ignored it. I just put it aside. It's fascinating, you know, when you see yourself from a distance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, know thyself and uh, it's amazing how <laughs> this a lot of things can help you do that. Yeah. Somebody before mentioned uh, the Joseph of Aramati, I think. I don't quite agree with that because Richard Kerr points out that actually Aramatia means uh, best disi discipleship town. It's like an, an allegorical uh, name. It, doesn't well, seem it might be. But what he's doing kind of sounds to me like what the uh, writers of Genesis and Exodus were doing with etymological uh, stories that uh, that you take what might be just a pun that you're accidentally creating and figuring okay I've read the mind of the author could well be um, and there are other ideal characters like Nicodemus whose name means ruler of the people and uh, Martha the lady of the house Zacchaeus uh, which means charity or alms and uh, so on down the line uh, but uh, the uh, to me it's no less plausible to say it comes from uh, Bar Matthias uh, Joseph Bar Matthias mm -hmm. becomes Arimathea. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I, I, it's yeah. like an embarrassed yeah. riches to me. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? I mean, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. And, and and you know, and one of the things I do believe is that Josephus is in the New Testament. And and this is one of the last things. You know, I'm, I'm sort of. This is one of the things I brought up in my book as an example, which I don't know if it is. I don't. I don't know if it is a true parallel or not. Not sometimes. You know, a parallel has so many elements that are agreeing in both sources that you feel like this has to be a parallel. And in some cases, it's, it's just a hunch. And this is a kind of a hunch situation, but I'm the more I think about it, the more I'm prepared to buy into it. You have to remember there are two sources of uh, Jewish histories that were written in the first century that really describe um, the the Jewish war and and the period before the Jewish war. It's Josephus and it's Justice of Tiberius. And Justice of Tiberius is lost, but we know he didn't write about Jesus because this is what what a, a, a bishop in the what, what is it the ninth century said after having read it. But those are the two main sources. Okay, it's Justice uh, uh, of Tiberius and it is. Uh, Josephus, whose name was Joseph, son of Matthias, okay? So this is what's written in Acts. Just listen to this. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. 
So they proposed to Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justus, and Matthias. Do you, do you hear those names? Uh, did we lose Dr. Fries? Yeah, I think so. I don't yeah. see him anymore. Uh, yeah, he might be back. We'll see. <laughs> okay. But in any, in any event, so you have Justice there, you have Joseph there, you have Matthias, and then you just have Bar Sabas. And what does Bar Sabas mean? It means son of fighting. And, and what was Justice's father's name? It was Pistis. And Pistis means to beat, to pound, to crush. So wow. it's basically, yeah. So it's basically saying we have two witnesses. It's, it's Josephus and it's Justice. But only one of them will be chosen. And then it later says they chose just Joseph. Yeah, could be, could be. Yeah, they chose Matthias. They chose Matthias, yeah. Yeah, you put pretty compelling case. I, I really enjoyed it. Good. Actually, I, actually, I had to stay for only an hour, but I really enjoyed it that I continue to hear you. Well, I'm glad <laughs> that you were able to join us, Matt. I really appreciate you coming in. Yeah. Looks like we also lost Wayne. <laughs> yeah. Um, did you want to continue, uh, Doctor? No, no, uh, or Elena, I should say. Okay. <clears throat> because we could either, you know, stop now, or we. I, I had a few more questions. <laughs> if you want to ask them, you go ahead. Yeah, me too. Okay. I'm good. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, I'm thankful that you had mentioned uh, Paul earlier, and because uh, it occurred to me that the consensus view. Of, of the Pauline corpus, the authorship, around the 50s, which would kind of make it contemporaneous with, um, with the Egyptian when he was actually around, which kind of struck me as kind of odd because in the, if, assuming they're authentic, that um, Paul mentions, you know, this, his idea of the Christ crucified simultaneously or more or less with the death of the Egyptian in that time. And he apparently deals with established Christian churches which to me suggests that either the Paulines might be much later, as Dr. Price maintains, or that Christianity was already existent, possibly without a historical founder, maybe like a mystery called a Semithesis uh, maintain, uh, and so would have escaped the notice of contemporary historians being some obscure mystery cult. And I also later on thought that in the case of the Jesus mystery theory that you mentioned, that possibly it was just the Egyptian Jesus or Paul writing under a new name right after he supposedly disappears in Josephus. So I just wanted to, to, to ask you about what do you think of the consensus view of the Paulines being uh, written in the 50s? Uh, okay, I, this is, this is the, probably the most, I think uh, Paul, uh, aside from the issue of whether Paul and Jesus are the same person, Paul is probably the, the most complicated, uh, is the most sort of valid, I think, uh, counter-argument. Um, and I'll, 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 I'll get to the letters, but in general, both letters and acts, if you look at the letters and acts, uh, they describe a period of approximately 20 to 25 years between conversion and arrest, right? So if you, if you figure, did we lose Bob is the question here. Yeah, it looks like we lost Bob. So if you, if you figure that, uh, that, uh, that Paul came after, if, if the Egyptian is Jesus and Paul came afterwards, and you add on from, let's say, 55, uh, if the Egyptian vanished in 55, you add on another 20 to 25 years, it's impossible, right? Because you, gave, you get beyond the year 70, and none of the stuff that acts describes as happening to uh, Paul in, in uh, Jerusalem could have happened because there was no Jerusalem after the year 70. Certainly was no infrastructure like that that is described uh, in, in Acts pertaining to Paul. So I, I deal with this at length in the book. Uh, what, was it really 20 to 25 years between conversion and arrest in Jerusalem. And I maintain, no, it was only about five years. And my reasoning is the following. I'll, first of all, I'll answer your question. The, the whole timing 
of, of the New Testament, be it the letters of Paul or the Gospel or Acts or anything else, is based on names, right? It's, it's based on dignitaries that we knew were active in a, in a particular time period. That's how we make our timing. And that's how you change the timing. You change, if you want to change the timing, you just change the name of people. You change the name of a dignitary and you come to a different time. Okay? If you write it's Pilate instead of Felix, then you're suddenly 20 years earlier. So I would say, it, I haven't looked in particular to the timing of, 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 uh, of the letters of Paul, but it, I would say that it, you know, the same rule applies here. If you want to change the timing, all you have to do is change some names. Now, my argument, and why do I say it's only five years, is that if you look at Acts next to the letters, this is the classical problem with harmonizing Acts and the letters of Paul. It's almost impossible. They don't harmonize. They simply do not harmonize. In, 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 in Acts, you find all these travels that you don't find in the letters. And in the letters, instead, you find these 17 empty years that you don't find in Acts. You find first three empty years after the, after the conversion, and then you find 14 years where he just, you know, before he starts his traveling, and then before his first return to, to Jerusalem, rather, where nothing seems to happen. And the interesting thing is that in Acts you have like five or six journeys to Jerusalem, whereas in the letters you have perhaps three. So what is the story here? And my what I would what I would suggest is that in fact this is the most complex aspect of the time shift theory, and that is that by the time Paul arrives in Rome, the time has to be right. Presumably he was known in Rome. So if the uh, so if, if the uh, uh, Acts and the letters <clears throat> sort of hint that Paul is arriving in Rome around, say, 61 CE, this is probably correct. So how do you get a period that goes from a conversion around, say, 35 CE to an arrival in Rome that is perhaps 61 CE to be instead a conversion in the mid-50s to be an arrival in 61. You do it by adding years. How do you add years? Well, in the letters it's very clear. It's 17 empty years. You just smash in 17 empty years and you change a few names and you suddenly have instead of five or six years, you can have 20 or 25 years. How do you do it in Acts? Well, in Acts it's full of events. These, these 20 to 25 years is act with events, events that you do not find in the letters. And so my suggestion is that the problem, why you cannot harmonize acts and the letters is because the time shift has been applied in, in a different manner in the two sources. In acts, in, the, in the, the letters, you've just put in 17 empty years. In acts, you've moved events that happened after his arrest in Rome and moved it the time before his arrest in Rome. So you fill up the time with events that you don't see in the letters. And this is the classical thing, this is what I'm, what I'm arguing in the book in general, that I think that Luke in Acts is written with a time shift in mind, whereas the earlier material, I think, has been time shifted retroactively and, and, and more primitively. Uh, and I argue uh, with that about uh, in relation to Matthew and the return from Egypt, etc. And I would say that's probably the case also with the letters. You put in those 17 years, you've solved the problem, but suddenly it doesn't harmonize with, with Acts because Acts, you have instead moved material from a later period to an earlier period. And there is even, if I can find it quickly, a very uh, strange... Uh, thing that is said in Acts, uh, if I can find it, yeah, Acts 26, 19 to 20, an imprisoned Paul says to King Agrippa II, quote, King Agrippa, I was not a disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus then in Jerusalem and throughout the countryside of Judea and also to the Gentiles that they should repent 
and turn to God and do deeds consistent with repentance. Now this is after his imprisonment. He's just spent like years and years traveling around the Mediterranean according to the act, to Acts, and it's not here. He says he spent all this time preaching in Jerusalem and throughout the countryside of Judea, and then he adds, and also to the Gentiles. So I would say that he probably hadn't made all those journeys around the Mediterranean yet. He had probably spent time in, in Cilicia, in, in Tarsus, and then come back, but I don't think there were any 20 to 25 years. It was probably just a few years. Are you with me? Yes, I'm following that. Uh, when I first read it, because I was like just prior to that, like trying to, to look at the chronologies between Acts and the epistles, and I noticed on the table here that you can probably see while I'm speaking, uh, this is from your book, where you align the third visit of Jerusalem and the second visit of Jerusalem, which I thought was something that I had thought was that made sense in chronology. But let me scroll up a bit, and here we have all this missing area here. And to me, um, you explain it with the time shift, and I'm thinking, well, I'm explaining it possibly as this is just fictional filler that was just thrown in there in order to fill up the space. That it wasn't that he was doing this stuff later or earlier at the time, but rather it was just thrown in there. And then that shifts everything to where you need now a new visit to Jerusalem because you've just created all this extra stuff. So it was kind of difficult for me to accept the time shift hypothesis as an explanation for some of this stuff. But now that you're explaining it to me, in person, it's making a little bit more sense to me. Okay. I mean, you you have to assume that the, you have to, at some point in the story, get back to real time. Uh, and I would suggest that the time of, of the arrest and the time of the imprisonment and the time of the journey to Rome is real time. And the interesting thing is that when you actually look at the stories of the... Uh, of the arrest and imprisonment in Jerusalem, then suddenly uh, the uh, dignitaries that are presented are really seem to be the right people. You know, whereas earlier, you 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 there's a description of Pilate, and he doesn't sound like Pilate when you read about Pilate in Josephus. It sounds more like Felix, but when you read about Agrippa II, then you read when you read about the stuff that's being presented in connection with the with the uh, with the rest, it suddenly sounds like it's the right people that are being described. So my guess is that actually that time point is correct, that really he did arrive in Rome around 60, 61, 62, something like that. Does anyone else have anything to add about that? OK, I, want, I wanted to just show this one graph from your book, uh, and I'll just make a point, but it's not well thought out, unfortunately. <laughs> not as well thought out as your arguments, but let me just display this real quick. There we go. Okay. Okay. Yeah, this is one of the graphs, uh, excuse me, one of the uh, graphics from your book, where it shows the um, New Testament chronology, where you see the Gospel section and then the Acts section. And then you see your hypothesized actual chronology, which is shifted later. So this is meant to illustrate the time shift. Right. Um, <clears throat> one thing I was thinking of is that, um, going back to what I said I had problems with the time shift as an explanation of uh, some of the um, discrepancies in chronology, I'm a person that over the years kind of got into sources, so I'm thinking that there's, you know, proto-Mark Gospels, there's synoptic sources that are pre-existent to say Mark, and that there was a passion narrative that was independently composed by somebody, whoever it may be, and incorporated later. And to me, I thought that was the earliest type of stuff, that in that case it would mean that the time shift really would have had to have occurred earlier than Luke. Mm -hmm. Why? Uh, if if those synoptic sources are early, say like, you know, very earlier than say seventy when Mark actually composed his gospel, that he was using sources that were earlier than his gospel, that some of these might have already contained the shift. Because what what I'm thinking is, this passion narrative to me is 
an allegory of the fall of Israel up to 70. And that's one of the reasons I thought that the Mark's Gospel is kind of open-ended at the end, going only up to, uh, you know, first few verses of chapter 16, where the story was not yet written that there had, you know, Mark was aware that the temple had been destroyed, but that was not the end of the story. Jesus mentions that one of the people there says that, you know, he's gone before you into Galilee, in other words, into the diaspora, diaspora of the Gentile communities after the destruction of Rome, that there is going to be further, in other words, it's pointing towards the eschaton, that, you know, that is still coming because, you know, there's still more to be written about the history of Israel. The end of the temple is not the final word. That this allegory was then taken by, say, a community like Matthew's is very literal. They wanted to turn it into an actual story of an individual, give them a genealogy, uh, make them fulfillment of the scriptures, and then somebody like Luke comes along and sees the compression, what we might say is instead of a time shift, a time compression, into an allegory of it, and wants to expand it. So we're talking like maybe instead of a time shift, a time expansion, which is why I wanted to show this graphic. It's like this smaller actual chronology, in fact, was not shifted, but an expansion of the top line, for instance. Or it was expanded into the top line, I should say, in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, I must say I wasn't following you the whole way, but that's, I think that's what I'm saying, that it was, it was a shorter period that was expanded into a longer period, that events between the late 40s and the early 60s have been expanded to be the late 20s to the early 60s. But I wasn't following you completely. I apologize. <laughs> no, no, that's my fault. No, that's my fault. I mean, basically what you're suggesting was that the time shift had already happened before Luke. Yes, and that he was just making it more explicit because he had recognized the allegorical nature. And maybe the, it wasn't the intention of whoever wrote the synoptic, say, passion narrative to create a time shift, but rather just an allegory, which was then considered to be an historical period of time that they had to deal with. Okay. I mean, uh, I don't know if this r relates to your question, but I would say my reason for thinking that the time shift is applied during the writing of Luke and Acts is because um, it's so much more elaborate and it's, first of all, it has so many more of the hints of another story uh, and also because um, Mark and Matthew have some very strange errors or at least weirdnesses that 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 makes me believe that this is because there was a, a, a very primitive application of the time shift. And I, uh, let me just give one example. Um, when uh, Matthew describes Jesus' birth, which is he puts ten years at least earlier than Luke, and he says that he went with his family to to Egypt, and then he returns. Uh, uh, when Herod had died, he returns as a child to his hometown. And then the next sentence reads, At that time, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching, I forgot the exact wording. And you just stop and you say, Wait a minute, if, if Jesus returned as a child from Egypt to Nazareth, how can John the Baptist start preaching at the same time? They are the same age. I mean, this is clearly stated in, in Luke that, that there is a, perhaps a six-month age difference between them. And to me, the explanation to that would be that they have just changed the name of the king who died from perhaps Agrippa I to Herod the Great. And, and suddenly you, you get a problem, and he has to be a child. You follow me? Where, whereas if, I mean, the, if you just change the name of a dignitary, you get new problems. And that this is an example of a, of a, of a very strange, if it was written really like that, that John the Baptist started preaching at the same time as Jesus returned as a child uh, to, to Nazareth, and something is very odd, since we know they were the same age. So I would I would suggest that this was a very primitive fixing of 
of the time, of the chronology. We don't know we, that Mark intended them to be the same age, though. That's something Luke could have added Luke to Mark. Says, yeah, Mark may have not have course. intended to be the same age. Sure, sure. I mean, uh, but I mean, yeah, but you can, you can, sure, but where, what can you trust them? If, if, I mean, Luke at length describes them being the same age. Sure, that's possible that they weren't. But this is what we have. And furthermore, uh, uh, the whole story of the return from Egypt in every other source except for Matthew, that is in later sources where it's talked about Jesus returning from Egypt, he always returned as an adult. And then uh, you also have the very strange stories in all the synoptic gospels where he returns to Nazareth uh, and goes to his synagogue and it's like the people don't recognize him. And then suddenly they sort of say, isn't that the child of, you know, it's like they knew him as a child, but now he's come back, and and he's been away for many, many years. He's the return of, of the you know the prodigal son, and this also is a support for the for the concept that he really was away for a long time from his home time, town as an adult. Maybe look. Yeah. Oh. Maybe Luke wrote uh, Matthew because he saw the discrepancy that Jesus came back as a child while uh, John the Baptist was preaching as an adult. Maybe Luke knew that there was a discrepancy. Yeah, but I, I mean, I'm just hypothesizing. I have no idea. But my hunch is that it wasn't Luke who changed Mark and Matthew. Luke just wrote with something more elaborate in mind. And I think that the, 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 the shifts of the names of dignitaries in Mark and Matthew were done by other people, and, and crude, more crudely. That's, that's what I would get. Speaking of shifting, what, what do you think then is the status of the testimonium Flavianum? Because from your theory, it sounds almost undeniable that it is, is, is a deliberate forgery. Do you, do you agree with that? But deliberate, or I mean, this is, I mean, this is. There have been, you know, kilometers of, of text on the testimonium Flavianum. I'm, I'm not gonna. I mean, I don't think I have anything to add. My, my, I think that I'm correct to say that the absolute majority of scholars say that it at least has been tampered with. That it's not the original text. Uh, Testimonium Flavianum. Uh, my guess is that it's uh, been added, uh, that it's a Christian interpolation, which, you know, some people claim they believe it's, it's, a, it's a complete new edition. Other people say there was an original text which has been changed some. I think there are very few people who are prepared to say it, it is in its original form. Uh, I got cut off before I, my computer is acting real strange, and I, I see the, some of the same weird signs again. So uh, I, I think I'm going to have to drop out of this. Uh, and I just wanted to say what a privilege, a pleasure it is to talk to Lena and the rest of you, and uh, uh, a whole lot to think about. Thanks a bunch. Thank you, really thank you, Bob. Thank, thank you, Bob. And and uh, and I really, I want to say, I've really. Uh, Appreciated all the contact I've had with you over the years. It's been oh, really vice versa. You're a genius. No, I wouldn't say that. But thank you very much. Yeah, thank okay. you Bob, for joining I us. I appreciate it. I don't think you are. Go ahead, Matt. I'm so you got cut off. Martin, is is that who? Sorry, yeah. Martin. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's Martin. Yeah. I got to know. I, I got to know by this hypothesis on Facebook because some some Bible geek uh, listeners posted some of the of this stuff, and I said, why well, don't give it a try? So, well, if there's any listeners out there who want to join a Bible geek listeners Facebook group, you're welcome to. I mean, there's very little that escapes the members of the group as far as what's current in biblical scholarship. I mean, it's, I usually find out about it first through the group. So are we re reaching the end, or where? where, where? Yeah, there's, there's so much more to cover, I'm sure, but 
Um, we usually try to keep Hangouts uh, no longer than a couple hours. That you know, okay. most people reach their limit, and a lot of people are in different time zones, so it might be yeah. very late for them, for instance. So I got to ask so. the really controversial question then, since you okay. seem to be really up on Josephus and stuff. So, okay, I, was, I hope I hope this isn't too controversial to ask. Was the Romans' action in the war justified? The Romans' action in the war justified? I mean, who can ever talk about justification? I mean, uh, this is such a this is such a um, complex situation. I mean, this this demands a long discussion. I think the whole issue of the Roman occupation and the end. I mean, I actually bring some of it up in the book. I mean, to some extent, uh, the Jews brought it on themselves. I mean, it was the it was it's an exceptionally it's like what happens to a society that is breaking apart. It it becomes self-destructive, and and what happened in Jerusalem uh, when before the Romans entered? I mean, they were surrounding it, and the way the different groups in Jerusalem were massacring each other is it's it's so uh, it's so horrible to read because it makes you realize what can become of human beings in a in a in a situation of, of, of crisis. I mean, of course the war wasn't justified. I, I mean, there's no justification for it. I mean, to some extent, the, the Jews brought it upon themselves even from the beginning because they invited the Romans in, in from the beginning in, in the year 63. Uh, you can never say it's justified to, to, to massacre and people and level uh, a city. I, I don't think it's justified. But it is a multi-dimensional war that teaches us a lot about how humanity acts in times of crisis. And it's frightening from that. It's really a watershed event, very much a watershed event, not only for Judaism and Christianity, but it's, of course it's not a watershed event for, for the world, but it is, it's such a, it really, really shows you to what depth humanity can can fall on, in times of crisis and so it's it's interesting and valuable reading I think does that answer your question yeah thank you Lena yeah. does anyone else have any more questions for Lena actually I've got one uh, how do you think that uh, the mention of John the Baptist in Josephus, whether it's, uh, it's it was forged or not, that you just think? Oh, yeah. Uh, did, uh, yeah, I mean, I have a chapter on... Uh, oh, the theater thing. It, I have a chapter in, in the book on this. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, uh, what's fascinating is, is that if, if you do, if you do for the time being, as a premise, accept uh, that Jesus would be the Egyptian, and what you have is in Josephus the person that he, the messianic leader that he names before, the last messianic leader he names before the Egyptian is Theodos. And he calls them, he describes them using the same terminology. And now when you look at, at, at what, is, what, the, what uh, Josephus writes about Theodos, you see that not only is he the last, uh, messianic leader he describes before the Egyptian, not only does he describe them in the same terms as the Egyptian, but Theodos gathered his followers by the river Jordan and when the authorities uh, captured him, they took him alive and yeah, they cut yeah. off his head and they carried it up That's the to exact Jerusalem. Thing. And, and yeah, I like mean, uh, you know, I mean, it's like when you, when you see I mean, this is really a pattern that doesn't have one or two points. It has so many points yeah. uh, on the line that that you really, really have to analyze it and study it carefully. And uh, it's uh, Theodos is a very, very interesting character. And of course, if Theodos would be John the Baptist, then I would submit that in, in that case, then uh, the paragraph 
uh, in Josephus about John the Baptist is also an interpolation. Yeah. Personally, I think that John the Baptist symbolically represents all of the prophets. Okay. And in the Hebrew Bible, the prophets start with the book of Joshua. And in the book of Joshua, one of the first things that happens is the crossing of the Jordan River. Right. That, that is also true. I mean, he says that they will, they will, he will cross the Jordan, you know, he will make a path for them to cross the Jordan. Sure. I mean, there are, as I said, nothing is pure history. It's mixed in with um, all these kind of allegorical uh, references as well. So it's both. It's a mixture. It's a mixture of both. I think yes. that's what is happening. Yes. Anyone else have any more comments? Alrighty. Well, then, in that case, I'd like to thank Dr. Einhorn for uh, joining us today. I really appreciate her uh, vast knowledge and her information that she has given us today. Um, <clears throat> My observation is that, yes, there were some, I had recognized some inklings of some of this information. Some of the parallels struck me as kind of strange. But when she wrote her book and it brought it to all attention, then she bring up so many more intriguing parallels and information that it, that's what the fascination of this argument is, is that there was much more material out there that no one had really even considered or imagined in the context. So I think that is the great comp contribution of a shift in time book, is that it has opened up this discussion and opened up possibilities that no one had considered before. So I applaud you for that, Dr. Einhorn, and we really appreciate it. Thanks. And call me Lena, even if we're Lena. at the end. But Lena. thanks a lot, John. And, 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 uh, and I'm really grateful uh, for, for you taking the time. And I know you took a lot of time. You read the book. Twice, and you read my previous work, and I'm, and you, and you spent a lot of time preparing this, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to discuss it. Oh, my pleasure. I enjoyed it. It yeah. was very informative Thanks. and worth every bit of the time I spent on it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, Lena, for being here. Thank you, John, for putting this together. I, I enjoyed this too. All right. Thank, thank you all very much, and talk to you soon. I hope.